Hello everyone and welcome back to the last pattern recognition lecture video um, in this series about deep learning. This here will just be a short video where we look at some alternative popular architectures that exist, which we didn't get to cover either in the convolutional or sequential data model videos. The first architecture we'll be looking at here is what is known as autoencoders. So the basic autoencoder network, if we have linear activation functions, is as such uh, equal to um, principal component analysis or short PCA. And what is it that PCA is? PCA is a uh, dimensionality reduction method um, which protects each data point onto only the first few principal components. And these uh, principal components, they are the directions that maximize the variance of the project data where we have these uh, principal components being ordered um, such that the first principal component is the direction with maximal variance, the second principal component is, component is maximizing the variance in a direction orthogonal to the first direction, and so on. Um, but the idea here is that you have uh, some input here, and you as such want the same output. This could be an image, uh, for instance, that you are uh, putting in as the input and then you want the same input uh, image as the output and then you learn this latent space here which can then represent your images in a compact way. So the basic autoencoder setup uh, contains gaps in its latent space um, so as the latent space is not well separated. And here we have an example where um, with our autoencoder, we're trying to learn the different numbers, so zero to nine. And then we see here, also when projected just onto the two, uh, two dimensions here, that all of these here um, is, is one number, all of these here should be another number, I guess four. And yeah, then we have these points which are, are not uh, in the same range as our, our data set, which you can see they become very, very blurry and it's very difficult to see what it is. So as you come around the problems with the standard autoencoder, um, we have the variational autoencoder, also short VAE, where the encoder is learning an, an approximation of the posterior distribution instead. And this latent space is now regularized to a standard normal distribution. Let's see how that looks like. So now instead of just having our latent space um, as before, then we are trying uh, to model our latent space as a standard normal distribution. And if you go through the whole um, setup, how this is this works, then there is a small reparameterization uh, trick, which is also what is shown here, that the set variable is now, um, yeah, the mean plus some standard deviation uh, and some noise, where this noise is uh, standard normal distributed. And here we then have means of some of the different uh, digits of the uh, MNIST dataset, where you can see that at least they look like you can get an idea of what the numbers are here. But one of the problems also with various also encoders is that they, especially for images, they get very, very blurry on the um, like uh, on, uh, on the output of, uh, such a, of such a network. So to the rescue of various knowledge encoders is generative adversarial networks, the short GANs, uh, which have become really, really popular in the, in the last few years, where the main idea is that you have a two network setup. You have one network, which is the generator, where the objective is to fool the discriminant network by generating more real images. And then we have the discriminator network, which is to become better in discriminating real and fake images. So what as such this does is it's trying to learn a really, really good loss function in the discriminator. So instead of trying to set up a network that generates images 
and have some laws um, trying to quantify how similar your input image and your output image is, for instance, for the variation autoencoder, then here you have a whole other network where you are trying to learn um, a really good loss function that um, can discriminate between real and fake images. So over time, obviously, the idea is that this generator becomes so good in creating images close to the ones in the training data sets is that it can um, fool the discriminator, but also the discriminator will uh, likewise also become better in discriminating between these now better uh, produced fake images. So there are a ton of uh, very popular applications out there for, for guns, especially for creating images, um, faces where it was uh, shown to do really well. So if you go to the website, this person does not exist. This will just give you a random person um, generated from such a, a network uh, known as StyleGAN, um, where we have a link to the, the paper here in the, in the button, a paper from NVIDIA. And you just continue refreshing a browser every once in a while, and it'll produce a new image all the time, which again does not exist. So an image that does not look like any of the images in it, the training data, but it is something that the generator learned um, to create these uh, uh, images that looks, yeah, real, really realistic, very similar to the ones in the um, in the in the training set. There's also uh, cars, as you can see here, which uh, again has also gun has also been trained to um, generate. And you can also, just like this person does not exist, there's also another website, this cat does not exist.com, where you can also go and, and try to look at different cats that does not exist in reality. On the language processing side, there's uh, been a lot of improvement uh, since the transformer networks were introduced. And so here we just, uh, I just mentioned two of them, GPT version three. So all the way back from GPT-1, GPT-2, and there's also been different iterations of this network, which is known as BERT, which is from Google. So BERT stands for this bidirectional encoder representation for transformers. And BERT here has 340 million parameters in its large version. And the way you use BERT is that you, it's a huge, pre-trained network 300 with these 340 million parameters or there's also uh, some of these networks with uh, fewer parameters so around 100 million so i think that's the 110 million parameters i think that's the most popular one and then the idea is that you are fine-tuning um, the last couple of layers to a specific task um, with yeah by by adding a few additional output layers um, on the other side, we have GPT-3 uh, from OpenAI, which is the newest uh, and best performing at the moment, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer, and this is then version 3, which has literally blown all uh, competition out of, the, out of the way. So this network now has 175 billion parameters uh, and it can perform specific tasks without any special tuning by providing a few examples. Uh, and as such, like in the paper, they mentioned less than 10. So you can see here going from 340 millions to 175 billions, there's a quite a, a, a scale magnitude between the number of parameters here. Uh, and these tasks that uh, the GPT-3 network um, it can do is everything from translation to programming to uh, acting as an author. S if we look at the two transformer networks, then how these are traditionally uh, trained is they're trained in on, on a general huge data set, usually Wikipedia and a lot of other uh, text data. And then every all, all networks not gpt3 what you have to do there is you have to provide some additional training data to train it for a specific task 
for instance, in this case here, where it is from English to French translation, then you provide a few examples. So sea otter, how that translates, peppermint, how that translates to, to French, uh, plus giraffe, how that translates, and then update, the, update your uh, few fine layers of the network. And then you can then use it uh, for inference, for instance, what is the translation of cheese. So on the opposite side, we have uh, GPT-3, which can also work in zero shot. So the model predicts the answer given only natural language description of the task. So no gradient updates are performed. So you provide a task to it, say translate English to French, and then you provide uh, what it should then translate, so in this case cheese, and then it tries to translate this. Then you can also help it a bit on the way by giving an examples of uh, how to translate English to French. So again, here's the task, translate English to French. You give them some example, you give the network some examples. So how does, how do you translate sea otter? Uh, and then you want to use the network for inference um, by, uh, by translating cheese here again. And you can extend this also to future learning by giving it multiple examples. And if we then look at the performance of this network, we see that it uh, dramatically improves by having a few additional examples to learn on. But we also see that, in fact, this, um, this 175 billion parameter network uh, just by giving a few examples uh, of, of a specific task that has not specifically been trained to, is already performing really, really well, um, at least on, on the task here as described in the paper. Then they do also mention some training, uh, so petaflops per days that uh, the network is running. So we see here GPT-3 with its 175 billion parameters all the way to the right and the base or the la uh, large bird, like it's still um, a lot of magnitudes more complex to train this GPT-3 network. There's even a, a new paper from this year called An Image is Worth 16 times 16 Words, Transformers for Image Recognition at Scale, where at least uh, the paper so far claims, so the paper is still on the review, that you c they, they now show how to use um, a transformer network for image classification. So inputting an image, then from the title, it also says that then you are um, separating this image into 16 by 16 um, small uh, image patches and feeding this into the transformer network. And this then performs really well on the just the standard classification task of ImageNet. And interesting uh, results or some thing they show in the paper is, for instance, this attention from the transformers, um, how we can use this to get, uh, yeah, figure out what is actually important for the network to do its cl final classification. So highlighting the attention of, of the network. So now I'll just give a, a brief outlook of deep learning where we are today, uh, what it can do, what it cannot do. So deep learning today is essentially everywhere and will spread even more to even more areas in the years to come. So even though deep learning is popular, one should always analyze the problem at hand and pick the best tool. Um, so there's still many problems with deep learning, for instance, the architecture understanding, reasoning capabilities from context, robustness against adversarial attacks, um, and also training these in fully unsupervised learning systems to avoid tedious label processes. Um, but as such, uh, always pick the best tool at hand. For instance, if you're using regression, um, a simple regression task. Uh, maybe this can can be solved in in closed form already. Um, if you're also doing a simple classification task uh, with a small data set, maybe logistic regression 
is doing really well for you. You don't need to have a deep, huge deep neural network with um, thousands or millions of parameters, uh, maybe a few uh, simple parameters and a very simple algorithm like logistic regression will do the job, um, maybe even better. One of the main downsides, I would say, also of deep learning is their the huge energy um, consumption. And there was this news article from last year that creating an AI can be five times worse for the planet than a car. Where in this uh, article, at least, they mentioned that uh, training artificial intelligence is an energy intensive process. We also saw from GPT-3 or this bird network that how many uh, Peter, Peter flops should be um, used or early on in the CNN architectures video where we talked about neural network architecture search where uh, several hundreds of GPUs were running constantly for a month just to find a good uh, network architecture. And then afterward you would do the training of this network architecture. So uh, at least some estimates suggest that the carbon footprint of training a single AI is much is as much as uh, 284 tons of carbon dioxide, uh, which is equivalent to five times the lifetime emission of an average car. Another important aspect when talking about deep learning is their uh, detection robustness. So from a news article from last year, um, AAA, uh, car, uh, like the insurance uh, AAA, um, they tested uh, some autonomous cars to see if they can detect pedestrians. And in fact, it showed that spotting a pedestrian walking in front of a car coming with 20 miles per hour, the cars only, um, in this test, uh, only 40% of the adult collisions in optimal conditions were avoided. Uh, so especially like for, for children, uh, none of, like very few were avoided. And at night, the system didn't even ping the driver to reduce the speed sometimes. So these deep learning systems, they definitely still have a, a long way to go before we can trust them fully, before they're fully robust in every single um, scenario, even if it's... Uh, snowy outside or if it's so dark uh, so uh, high sun that you cannot uh, that is blinding the camera even um, like we need a system that is robust enough to work in any uh, possible weather condition and any possible uh, like if the stripes in the road are missing then it should also still be able to uh, behave in a robust way Then I just stumbled upon a news article from a few days ago um, about deep learning prediction, where the AI pioneer uh, Jeffrey Hinton, he predicts that deep learning is going to be able to do essentially everything. And just if you don't know, then uh, Jeffrey Hinton here, he's um, a co-author of both learning representations by backpropagating errors which was published back in 1986. And he was also a co-author of the paper ImageNet Classification with Deep Convolutional Neural Networks, which is the paper introduced AlexNet. And even last year, he was also awarded the Turing Award together with Jan LeCun and Joshua Bingo. Um, and in this article, he he's just mentioning that he do believe that deep learning is going to be able to do everything at some point but um, we need more breakthroughs, just like the transformer networks, as you saw both uh, where we have BERT and the GPT-3 today. And we need more scale, so we need more data and we also need models um, with more parameters. So he mentioned that the human brain has around 100 trillion parameters to train. Uh, 100 trillion parameters, we have that in the brain. And GPT-3 has only um, which is the, still the network with most parameters as of today, it has 175 billion parameters. So it's only 0.1% of the number of parameters we have in the brain. So there's still some way to go, but at least uh, from, from this guy that has been working in the field for uh, the last uh, many, uh, many years, 
he is st still a strong believer that in the next uh, years uh, we'll get closer to uh, deep learning being able to do as such everything for us. And with that, we come to the end of this small series on deep learning. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something from it. Um, as in the last couple of uh, slides also, slideshows uh, here on the last page, we just have the, the credits, so the books, the different courses and the GitHub repositories um, where most of the content from these slides here, they are um, taken from. Okay, with that, thank you for watching and thank you for listening.